Well, I'm going to throw our audiovisual people for a loop. And before I introduce my family, I want to introduce you to Toby the tapir. Toby is a Malayan tapir, and he's an ex endangered species in um, Asia Pacific. And he is the mascot for our region. I use him when I tell kids, when I talk to kids about missions and about the never reach. You saw a video just a few minutes ago of a tribe that had been never reached until someone brought them the word of God, until someone proclaimed that Jesus died for them and loved them. They were a never reached tribe. There are millions of people that are never reached. And Toby, as an endangered species, is our mascot because he wants you to know that if people never hear the gospel, if they never hear the good news about the salvation through Jesus, that God loves them, they are endangered in the kingdom of God. They are endangered in the kingdom of heaven. Church, we cannot let that happen. We have the unfinished task ahead of us. And we have a God and a Holy Spirit that is wanting to work in us and through us to bring that gospel, to bring that hope, to bring that message to the world. My family and I, um, I don't know if they're having trouble, but my family and I, when the picture comes up, my husband and I have been married for 17 years. His name is Tim. And uh, I listened to the podcast last week, or the, not the podcast, the service last week of Pastor. And when he said, you know, have a hope worth dying for, I reminded me of what my husband used to say to me. Honey, when we were first married, he was so sweet. Honey, I love you so much. I would die for you. And that was awesome. I was like, oh, but then after serving on the mission field for a few years and him having a few near-death experiences and him praying, Lord, I'm ready to go, and me praying, God, don't take me him. <laughs> please don't take him. I said, honey, please do the harder thing and live with me. You don't have to die for me. <laughs> Just live with me for a long time. <laughs> so praise God, we've been married for 17 years, and we have three beautiful children that were born to us. My son in the back is... Uh, TJ, and he is 6'5", and about 300 pounds, and yes, he plays football, but he is 15 years old. <laughs> People ask what I feed him, I say I try not to. <laughs> but um, my other children, my daughter, Ariana, she is 14, and just, just a beautiful young lady, loves the Lord with all of her heart. She's a runner, she loves to run, she's one of those awesome people. And then my youngest, Gracie, she, her first name is actually Esperanza. Um, my heritage, I know you're not seeing it here, but my mother is a Mexican immigrant. And uh, Esperanza is the Spanish word for hope. And her name is Esperanza Grace. So she goes by Gracie, because my dad couldn't uh, um, pronounce Esperanza. <laughs> but um, those are my children, uh, 15, 14, and 12. And we were called to the country of Indonesia many years ago. I went there first as a single missionary in 2001. Um, there's a huge story to that, I tell you what, because where I came from, I came from a small town in Montana. I grew up in a trailer, <laughs> and my dad was out of work a lot of time. My mom couldn't work because she wasn't a citizen. And they taught me the things that God put in my heart that led me all the way to Indonesia right out of college. And I served there for two years. After that, I came back to marry my husband, and then we were commissioned as a family in 2005. Um, it was just the two of us at that time. Uh, to go back to Indonesia, and God gave us two beautiful children before we did. So we made it to the field in 2007, and we served there ever since. We've only been back in the States since July of last year. Indonesia is one of the world's biggest secrets. It is the world's largest Muslim country. It is the fourth largest population in the world behind China, India, the United States, 
and then Indonesia. There are over 204, I always say this wrong, 2,400,000 people in Indonesia and 212 million of them are Muslim. Now, to put this into perspective, that means there are more Muslims in Indonesia than there is total population of all the Middle Eastern states combined. It's a powerhouse in the Islamic world, and God called us there. Not only that, but he called us to people, one at a time. And one of those people was my foster daughter, Ika. Ika came to us uh, as a 14-year-old girl. Her dad had died, and her mom was going to marry her off because she just couldn't care for her anymore. And Ika wanted to go to high school. And so we had an arrangement. She became my foster daughter, and she was able to continue her education. Ika was, she, she was a good girl, and she wanted to love God, but she struggled. She had some real struggles, just like a lot of young people these days. And I, you know, for many years, she improved my prayer life. <laughs> and I am glad to say that today, she is my glory to God, my prodigal come home. And Ika has made me a grandma. <laughs> my grandbaby, Eva Joy Rose, is named after my mom. And yes, I'm not a spring chicken, but no, I'm not old enough to be a grandma. <laughs> I am blessed and honored to be one. I love them dearly. Ika lives on the island of Sulawesi, and this is the island that our family was called to go to early on in our ministry. We had been serving on the island of Java. All total, we've served in, on two different islands and four different cities, or towns, villages, whatever you want to call them. And um, before we went to Sulawesi, I was afraid to go, and our friends were afraid for us to go. I didn't want to go to these people. I thought, Lord, just leave me in Java. Java has plenty of lost people. <laughs> but no, the Lord spoke very clearly and said, the boogeyman needs Jesus too. You see, Sulawesi is home to a tribe called the Boogies people. There's six million people, they are never reached. And the Boogies people, some people say they're violent. We like to say they're passionate. <laughs> if you make a Boogies friend, you have a friend for life. If you make a Boogies enemy, your life may not be so long. <laughs> and my children were toddlers at this time. I had three kids under the age of five. And I said, Lord, how could you want me to go to these people? You see, the Dutch, when they first colonized there, this is where the story of the boogeyman comes from. They went in, and the boogies were passionate <laughs> about them not being there. And they would put up trip wires with pots and pans around their houses. They would, when they tucked their children in at night, they would look under the bed and in the closet to see if there was a boogies man or a boogeyman there and tell their children, don't go out in the dark at night. And of course, that story traveled back to Europe and then became Hollywoodized, and, and we have the boogeyman. But I'm here to tell you, he's a real person. And the boogeyman needs Jesus. Now this place, um, I didn't share this in the last service, so you get to hear this, but there were missionaries that tried to go there in the early 1990s. And they did everything. They itinerated and said, we're going to the boogeyman. And when they got to the field, they were told no. The government would not allow them. The local people, the boogies, would not allow them to come. They didn't want any foreigners to live among them. And so for 20 years, this couple prayed. They prayed down spiritual walls. They prayed that hearts would open and doors would open. And when my family stepped off the plane in 2011 and stepped into immigration on the, in the Boogies land in Sulawesi, God threw those doors wide open and we walked in. But before that, God spoke to me and prepared my heart because he told me, it's not your job to protect your children. It's your job to prepare them. It's your job to prepare them to go as missionaries to the boogies. They are called just as much as you are. 
And he took me back to the place where I saw them dedicated, and I promised God to give them to him. And he took me to the place in, Dan, in the book of Daniel where Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but do not forget, they never forgot who they really were. They never forgot that they were children of the Most High God. And when their faith was literally tested by fire, they were, they were able to stand and to see Jesus stand with them. In Daniel chapter 3, they told the king, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, then God who we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship your golden statue that you have set up. When I read this last night, I thought, well, maybe these guys were from New Hampshire. <laughs> Live free or die. <laughs> but how much more should we not live and say, I live to serve the living God. I live to serve the God who is able or die. That is a hope worth dying for and living for. So everything changed about my parenting. <laughs> As I taught my kids the word, I didn't just send them to Sunday school and expect the Sunday school teacher to teach them the word of God. I began to try to teach them myself the word of God, to read scripture with them. I began to pray with them and for them every day. And I began to talk to them about the things of God on a daily basis in everything we did. Church, if we don't complete the unfinished task, if our generation doesn't get it done and take the gospel to the ends of the earth, God is going to call our children. And God may be ready to call you we must prepare ourselves. We must prepare the next generation, and woe to us if we do not. It is the heart of God. So I've seen my kids turn in from missionary kids or MKs to kid missionaries, and it's been so exciting to watch. We had so many opportunities to do so many things in Indonesia. We had a children's home. We taught in the Bible school, we planted churches, we ran a community center, um, we ran a feeding program, and all sorts of things. But the REACH Center, Reading, English, and, and Conversation Hangout, was our, our um, learning center, our community center. And it was a place that my kids engaged in ministry, and they lived out what it meant to be a kid missionary. You can see TJ there, he's like this kid that is a tree, and the kids love to climb him and play with him, and he's a gentle giant. He loves chess and math. He started a chess club, and every day, or every uh, week, he would gather these boys that were Muslim and Buddhist and talk to them about making the right moves to win at life, and then they would play chess, and he would pray for them. My daughter, uh, the youngest one, Esperanza there in the front, she, uh, you can see her, she's playing Uno in that, in that uh, picture, but she helped with the after-school program. And we had MAs that came over that didn't speak English, or didn't speak Indonesian, and she would help translate for them and gather the kids and, and lead them. And she's just got this joyous personality, loves people. And my daughter in the back, Ariana, my middle child, she's quiet. She has a learning disability, but she has never let that stop her. She didn't read till she was nine years old. And now, in this picture, she was reading the Bible, reading a children's Bible to two girls that were also quiet, kind of in the background. Nobody else really noticed them. And God has blessed my daughter as she has been faithful. Right now, she is 14, and her reading level is above college level. But this is where it started. God is faithful when we are obedient. So that takes us to where God is calling our family now. Our mission is, has shifted a little bit. 
It has grown and expanded outside of Indonesia to all of Asia Pacific. We are now serving 40 countries in our region. My husband is the natural disaster relief coordinator for all 40 of these countries. If a disaster happens, he puts all the response together, and if a team goes in, he leads it. Since starting this last July, he has already worked five disasters and natu natural disasters in our region. He's like a fireman. <laughs> Everybody else runs out of a fire, he runs into it. <laughs> but God has equipped him to do that, and he's amazing at it. I'm so proud of him. Will you pray for me? <laughs> it is hard to let my husband do that. I won't, I won't lie, it's not easy. If God calls your kids to missions, it's not going to be easy. And if God calls your husband to do something like this, it's not easy. But God can do it. I am here today to represent Asia's little ones. And that is the ministry that our regional director asked me to oversee and to direct for this next term. And pretty much it's what I've been doing all along, just on a much bigger scale. Asia's Little Ones serves the entire region. We have 20, 23 ministries in 11 countries right now. Some of those are homes, children's homes, where children who are war orphans, they've lost their parents to violence, they can come and have a home where they are loved and where they have hope. Orphans that have lost their parents to natural disasters, children that have been abandoned, children that have been rescued from trafficking and sexual abuse, girls that need a safe place to live in order to go to school so that they don't have to be married at 13 and 14 years old. We also, at Asia's Little Ones, uh, partner with ministries that provide health care health care, that provide feeding, food, medical needs, and counseling for th and therapy for kids that, that have dealt with a tr incredible trauma. Lastly, we also support and resource ministries that um, offer educational opportunities and community development. I love this picture, this young man, his name is Dede. I first met Dede in my first Asia's Little Ones ministry in Indonesia. We were sitting on a grave sharing lunch. It was a feeding ministry that I led. A hundred kids every week would come, and most of them actually lived in the cemetery. Their mothers were um, in the red light district, and the cemetery was a safer place for them than in the brothels. So... These kids, every week, we would feed them and share Jesus with them. And we'd sit on the graves to do it, because nobody cares in a Muslim country what you do in a Christian cemetery. <laughs> so, in that place, that's where Day Day had his horizons lifted. Because, see, he used to walk around like this, and all he saw was, in my future, I'll be a beggar. And in my future, I'll be a part of a gang. And in my future, I might do drugs. And in my future... It was hopeless. But this program, I raised up another leader because I knew I was going to Sulawesi. They took it over, young Filipino and Indonesian couple, and they started doing youth development programs and tutoring and bringing this education element into it. And this young man in 20, 2018 graduated from law school. God is doing amazing things when we invest in one life at a time. So at Asia's Little Ones, we try to give hope. We serve the missionaries, Assemblies of God missionaries and national workers that lead these ministries. We, we provide them with resources financially. We also provide them with resources so that they can absorb the, the trauma of those that they serve. We help them with best child practices and child protection policies and sustainability. So let's talk about hope. Because that's, that's the whole theme, right? Hope rising. Let's talk about hope. But how, how do I tell a child rescued from being trafficked or abused that they should have hope? How can I let a child who has never known a life without hunger or sickness know that they should have hope? How do I tell a child whose entire community is illiterate that the word of God will explain our hope? 
In fact, how do I look at this world full of cancer and war and pandemic and pain and sorrow and have hope? Well, I'm here to tell you, it's not as hard as you think. Because our God, we have a great hope because our God is a God of justice. Our God is a God of justice. This whole concept of God as a God of justice has been, my kids hate it when I do that because they're like, Mom, you're too old to do that. (laughs) But it literally has been for me this year. I am rereading my whole Bible and looking for all the places where it talks about how God is a God of justice. Now, if you're like me, I once thought that justice meant more of like a, a judge and like a court type system where it's like, That's the judgment. That's the punishment. But there's so much more to it than that. You see, there's two parts of justice. And in the first part, Jesus shows us in the book of Matthew, right after he had healed a man whose hand had withered on the Sabbath, and the the Pharisees were upset about it. He showed us what what Isaiah had said about him. If we go to the scripture, it says, But Jesus knew what they were planning, so he left the area, and many people followed him. He healed all the sick among them, but he warned them not to reveal who he was. This fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah concerning him. Look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious, and his name will be the hope of all the world. You can't really understand that from our Western mindset and from the idea that justice only happens when a judge declares judgment. You have to go back And the Greek word diakosuni, or justice, is the translation of the Hebrew word uh, sadaka. The word means the divine energy which accomplishes man's salvation. Jesus was God's justice for the world. He was the divine energy that accomplished man's salvation. It is parallel, almost synonymous with the word hesed, which means mercy, compassion, love, and the word emeth, which means fidelity and truth. This blew my mind. If you reread that passage with that in mind, look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice, that he will accomplish man's salvation to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause mercy, compassion, love, and fidelity and truth to be victorious. There's so much hope in that. And his name will be the hope of all the world. Amen, right? There's more than one thing, one part to God's justice. Jesus brought salvation and mercy. And when Jesus came at the incarnation, he brought, he ushered in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God already, but there's also the kingdom of God not yet. Jesus established his king on or his kingdom on this earth. Jesus is our hope. You see, when Jesus came, he came humble and meek and as a servant, and he healed the brokenhearted. He, he lifted up, he rescued, he restored. He, he bound up the wounds. He did all of those things because he came in, as a God of justice. And we as his church are the extension of Christ's kingdom mission to proclaim his justice in action and his hope to the world. 
that first part of justice that Jesus modeled, he told us, he commanded us to be a part of that. In the book of Matthew, he gave us the two great commandments. As a missionary, we often almost always just focus on the great commission. But church, we cannot forget that Jesus gave us two great commandments as well. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart and to love our neighbor as ourself. It all comes back to the love of God. And that part, as Christ's kingdom mission, the church must, as the extension of Christ's kingdom mission, the church must proclaim. We must live it as we follow in Christ's example. And church, can I tell you, God is honored by your faith and your obedience. God is honored when you walk obediently. Now, Jesus is coming again. And that is the kingdom to come, the kingdom not yet. And when Jesus comes again, he will come in great power. He will not come meek and lowly in a manger. He will come in power, and he will judge. So yes, there is that side of justice, but we are not invited to participate in that side of justice. That is for God and God alone. And we stand as a testimony in this world that we are a part of the kingdom of God and that our great hope is in the kingdom to come. Thy will be done. You see, church, sometimes we think my salvation, I, well, that day that I gave my life to Jesus, that that made my salvation done. No, it's the same as the kingdom of God. It's already not yet. When I stand before God, when you stand before God, that is when you will experience salvation in full. And that is when you will understand the kingdom of God in full. No sorrow, no pain, no war, no pandemic, no, no disease, no hate, no poverty. We are a testimony, a living testimony of that now. My dad was healed of cancer. 20 years ago, he was diagnosed terminal, and God miraculously healed him. My dad is almost 70 years old now, and he tells me all the time that he, he's in this body that's frail and dying and weak and, and tired. God healed him. That is a testimony of what is yet to come. But on that day when it comes, it'll be, it'll be perfect. He won't be in a dying body anymore. None of us will. Church, that is the hope that we need to give this world. In spite of all the stuff that makes us go, ah, how can we possibly survive? How can we possibly hope in the midst of all of this? We have that great hope. The world needs it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Praise the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God for what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. We confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops character, strength of character, and character strength strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Church, can I tell you, my family, it's not all that glorious to be on the mission field. In the past 15 years that we've been serving together as a family. My son has been hit head on by a motorcycle on his bicycle when he was six. My daughter was run over by a car when she was 13 months old. My husband was clubbed in the head and drug out in the street and beat up to die. I've been attacked personally twice and assaulted once. It has not been easy. We have faced sickness and disease. I have almost gone blind. There's so many things, trials and things that we had to face. But can I tell you, every single one of those was worth it 
because I learned something about my hope and I became more confident as Jesus stood in the fire through every situation, every situation. And I also got the opportunity to look into the eyes of someone who heard the gospel for the first time and to see their tears streaming down their cheeks. I got to pray for people and see them healed. I got to like touch people that nobody else loved, to hold children that had a future ahead of them that nobody else saw but our Lord. Church, every bit of it is worth it. Everything you give to God is worth it. Because every soul matters, and it has to be about souls. We are all called to pray. We are all called to give, and we are all called to go. Every one of us. You are called to pray for this church and your pastor. You're called to pray for your community. You're called to pray for the world. And if you don't know how to do that yet, or you're, you just say, you know, I just, I don't, I don't get it. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and to fill you with his love. Because I tell you what, if you've ever had kids or you've ever loved someone, I would do anything for my kids. I would do anything for my husband. I love them. And when God fills you with that kind of love for his world, for people that you'll never meet, you will pray for them and you will do anything for them. Ask God for that kind of Holy Spirit in your life. We are all called to give. I don't share this often, but I'm going to share it with you. I didn't share this with the first service, so you're special. But my husband and I have a goal to give more than we receive. And our goal in missions is to pick up a new missionary or, mis or ministry every year, as well as give to our local church's ministry and mission. And our goal in missions, in our giving, is to be a part of God's missional heart, what God is doing around the world in such a way that the sun never sets on our giving. The sun never, our mission's giving, the sun never sets on what God is doing around the world. That's our goal. Now God will speak to you about what God wants you to do in obedience, but that's what we are called to do. And we're all called to go. Whether it's to go into the next room, to our spouse or our parents, or whether it's to go across the street, or whether it's to go across the seas. We are all called to go. The Great Commission, we are all called to reach the world, to baptize, and to make disciples. We are all called. The next verse, the last verse I'm going to share with you today is my life verse. It's Acts 20:24, 20, and I want to be able to say, just like Paul, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the grace, wonderful grace of God. I'm going to go ahead and skip to our projects as we close. Your, your church, your district of churches, of Assemblies of God churches in Maine, you guys are amazing. I only came up here for the first time two weeks ago, and I am just blown away. Uh, just your people and your, your land and your food. Oh my goodness, it's so good. And we are so excited at Asia's Little Ones to partner with you guys on two projects of our 23. There's two of them that sparked in your district youth director's heart. And he's here, by the way. So you can say hi to him too, him and his wife. They're awesome. But we are partnering together in the Philippines with Child Community Ministry Philippines to promise malnourished children in targeted communities nutritious food and supplements, health education for their, fam for their parents, family services, and a strong demonstration of God's love in action. CCMP works with a local church for 6 to 12 months to bring lasting change. And if there is no local church, we bring a church planter to, help, to come and start work there. As many as 500 children are served every day. Our total goal for the annual cost of the project is $44,000. But that breaks down 
to $3,675 a month and only $7.35 per child per month. That's an expensive cup of coffee, but it feeds a child for a month. Now let me tell you, we're planning to do this in a big way as soon as the pandemic stops. Why do I say that? Because right now we have to shift how we do it. Because in the Philippines, they've been in lockdown since last March. If you're under 15 or over 55, you're not allowed to leave your home. The head of household gets a permit to leave twice a week, that's it. That's it, people are starving. And sadly, I have to tell you, because of that, cyber sex trafficking in the Philippines is by parents using their own children to make money on the internet is up 264%. CCMP is packaging food, and on the two days that they get, workers for CCMP are going to homes and delivering food offering hope for families so that they don't have to exploit their children. I cannot even tell you how important it is to partner with us on this project. All that numbers and stuff at the bottom, that's for your, your missions people so they know how to give to the project through BGMC. The second project I wanna share with you quickly is in Vanuatu. And this, this touches my teacher's heart because I was a teacher before I was a missionary and even while I was a missionary. But this project, we partner with Hope Pacific Mission and the missionaries there have already established eight schools in communities that before were completely illiterate. How do you do that? Well, we have a goal to establish 20 more and the way that they do it is that they go to the, the community and this community, by the way, has not been open to the gospel in the past typically and they go to the community and they say, we will build you a school. We will train you and help you to learn. And so the, the community agrees and they send representatives to come and learn to be teachers. They learn kindergarten and first grade the whole summer. And then they go back to their village in their newly built school and they have all the curriculum and they teach first grade and kindergarten that year. They come back the next year and they learn second grade and then they go back and teach second grade. And it just, it raises horizons and it makes them less vulnerable, but it also opens the door to the gospel because we use a Christian curriculum and questions come up real quick when the teachers are like, I have to teach this about the Bible. What is the Bible? <laughs> it's really exciting what God is doing there. We can plant a school for $3,800 seems like nothing well it depends I mean on your situation but to them it's everything and that equips them and gives them curriculum so I am so excited to partner with you and as I leave the stage I want to share with you a video that will help you to see the people and the places I love and I want my heart's desire is that as you watch this and as we worship at the end of service, that God will speak to your heart, that the Holy Spirit will fill you with such an incredible love for the never reached, that you will begin each little step of obedience in praying, in giving, and in going. After the video and after worship, I'm going to be over at the table there, and I have prayer cards. I would love to have you partner with us in prayer. Please come and see me and get one of those. Lord, I just lift up your, my brothers and sisters to you, your church. And God, I pray, Holy Spirit, come. Come. Speak to our hearts, oh God. Father, I pray that you would fill us with your love, that you would fill us with your mission, that we would truly stand as salt and light in this world because your kingdom has come and we are a part of it and because we stand testimony of your kingdom yet to come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for your great justice. In Jesus' name, amen.